Illumine our hearts and master your love as mankind. Pure light of that divine knowledge, open the eyes of your mind to the understanding of the gospel teachings. And plant all in us to fear thy blessed commandments, trampling down our carnal desires, mantra upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things well pleasing unto thee, without the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God, and to thee do we ascribe glory together with thy fathers from everlasting, thou all holy good and life creating spirit, but now and ever to the ages of ages. Amen. Okay, I want to get right into the topic of today's video. You know the information about my Patreon. If you enjoy this content, I would really um, uh, be very, very thankful if you made a monthly contribution to my Patreon. Uh, it's, uh, it's essential, it's instrumental to continuing to produce uh, this content. I really want to not, uh, not really have to paywall very much stuff at all. So uh, making these contributions, I know people make contributions in part to get paywalled content. But that's part of, you know, the, the difficulty I'm in. So if you think it's important that this content remain in general um, available for free to people who aren't sure whether, you know, they're interested in this stuff, I would really appreciate um, a contribution. But thank you to everybody who watches. I, I, I really um, am I'm genuinely very moved by the response that I've gotten. Okay, so... We know in the history of families that certain sins seem to run through generations, right? So you have alcoholism that runs through families. I've seen adultery run through families, generation after generation, and it gets covered up until it blows up. And when it blows up, there's this thing that happens. It tends to expose everything which comes before. This is just part of the way that the world ticks. The world runs according to deeper and more spiritual principles than we are used to thinking about. And it runs centered on Christ and his image, whose flesh he has taken on and glorified. The heartbeat of the human family is the heartbeat of the whole creation, which is why man is signified as a tree. I'm sure you're sick of hearing about trees. You won't say much more about it today. Man is signified as a tree, but you also have the imagery of the cosmic tree. You have the tree, its roots go deep into the earth, down to shale, the bottom of the earth. It extends up into high heaven, and it expands outwards. The structure of the branches, uh, branching out and multiplying in a kind of fractal way, mirrors by divine design the structure of celestial matter you have in fact language used of human relationships of celestial bodies and of arboreal bodies that mirror each other not intentionally consciously on the part of those who coin these words but because it is inbuilt into the structure of of our human mind that this is actually the way things are and we bear witness to it whether or not we know it and whether or not we want to know it which is why our language has been developed by many people who you know, are not uh, christians and sometimes are even hostile to christianity nevertheless we live in god's world and god is the father of jesus christ and nothing and nobody can change that so we will always bear witness to it in one way uh, or another um so how does this actually play out concretely? Well, if you look at the overall history of the human story, one of the uh, most striking features of the way the Bible tells its story is the way that it conceives of two seeds running in parallel. You can even see here the language of plants and trees and stuff. Uh, seeds. The woman has seed, the serpent has seed. In Isaiah, you have the seed of the serpent. It grows into a particular sort of tree. In the book of Judges, you have various bushes which are competing to become king, or rather competing not to become king, and it's the thorny one who ends up becoming king because a tree signifies the righteous, Psalm 1, Ezekiel 47. A thorn signifies the wicked. They perpetuate violence, as did Cain, who was the first thorn, and Abel was the first tree. Abel means hevel. It's a mist. It rises up from the ground just as a tree does. As a tree carries and sweetens that water it draws from the ground and turns it into sap. And as the first tree, he anticipates the tree of the cross because Christ says that Abel is the first martyr. 
Well, you've got the trees and the thorns, you've got the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, you have the wheat and the tares, and they grow up next to each other throughout the whole history of the Old Testament. You have this theme that God has predestinated by his divine will and foreknowledge, the crucifixion of Jesus. But he has simultaneously predestinated the growth of a remnant within Israel, a people within the people, who will be prepared to be the instrument through which all nations will be sanctified. See, Isaiah 27, verse 6, says that Jacob will take root. Israel shall blossom forth, put forth shoots, and fill the whole world with fruit. And it's in the same context that we hear about the remnant being gleaned out. God says, I will glean you out one by one, O people of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 17, you also have this very same dynamic going on. Let me just read it to you. Uh, it, it's, it's quite quite remarkable. Uh, in that day, this is verse 4, Isaiah 74, the glory of Jacob will be brought low. The fat of his flesh will grow lean. And it shall be as when the reaper gathers standing grain. You can hear the words of Jesus here, or words of John about Jesus, who gathers the wheat into his barn. As the reaper gathers standing grain, his arm harvests the ears. Who has, be, who has beheld the arm of the Lord? The Lord has bared his holy arm to all nations. We hear about the suffering servant. His arm harvests the ears as one gleans the ears in, of the grain in the valley of the Rephaim. Well, the Rephaim, well, these are the seed of the serpent in the most direct sense. These are the giants. Uh, are there a particular class of giants uh, whose story we first hear about in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Later in Numbers, we hear that this is a land which devours its inhabitants. You think about giant traditions from around the world. They're cannibals. Why is that the case? Well, the serpent eats dust, and dust, man comes from dust and will return to dust. So it signifies the fact that the devil was a roaring lion seeking those to devour. Uh, Isaiah 17, verse 6, gleanings will be left in it. As when an olive tree is beaten, two or three berries on the top of the highest bow, four or five on the branches of a fruit tree, declares the Lord God of Israel. So Israel comes to a remnant. But, verse 7, in that day, man will look to his maker. His eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the work of his hands. He will not look on what his own fingers have made, either the Asherim or the altars of incense. So we see in the day that Israel is whittled down to this remnant, it's in that day that man will begin to turn from his idols. And this is precisely what occurs in the history of the world, leading to the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. Not only the summation of Israel's history, but the summation of the entire human story because Israel is a representative humanity and not only a representative as if it just gives us a lesson, Israel is the instrument by which the human story is advanced. Well, Paul in Romans 7 speaks of the way, and we need to do another video just on this, but uh, for now I will just make a few points. He speaks of the way that God utilized the Torah to provoke the flesh in Israel, to intensify the presence of sin with a capital S, that is, the devil as the embodiment of evil, to provoke sin, to attack and focus his efforts in this one people group. And then he completed this project in attacking the king of Israel, the one who summed up the whole nation in his person. That's the king, Jesus Christ, crucified as king of the Jews. King of the Jews recognized as such by the Gentiles in three distinct languages that is nailed to the top of the cross. And the Satan, or sin with a capital S, uh, focuses his attack on Jesus, seeking to condemn Jesus, but, Romans 8, 4, God condemned sin. That is, Satan is sentenced to death in the flesh. In the flesh of who? In the flesh of Jesus. The devil was the one who was actually executed. The devil sought to sentence Jesus to an unjust death. The prosecutor's corruption having been found out, he is himself is put on trial and he is executed. Jesus says, now is the judgment of the, this world. Same context. Now is the ruler of this world cast out. So, on the one hand, you have the seed of the woman. Israel has been developed and taught various lessons throughout its history. During the period of the judges, Israel learns not to worship crude idols. They mostly learn their lesson. During the period of the kings, they mostly learn their lesson to worship God in the way that he commanded, namely worship at the temple. Don't build your own 
temple sites. You cannot build where God himself has not made himself known. You worship God according to the manner of his self-disclosure. Mostly, they do not crudely worship idols. Occasionally they do, but mostly they worship God, but in an improper manner. And then Israel, in the third period of their history, from, from the return from Babylon onwards, they worship God. They worship God at the place he commanded. They don't build high places. They don't worship Baal anymore. But they're hypocrites. They have a, a deeper problem, a problem of the heart. We see this in Isaiah himself, Isaiah itself, and Jesus, of course, is building on what the scriptures uh, say. This is what uh, uh, Isaiah 48 verse 1 says, Hear this, O house of Jacob. This is talking about uh, this period of history. Who are called by the name of Israel, who came from the waters of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord, and confess the God of Israel, but not in truth or right. This is what Jesus says. He says, you are on the outside, you're pure, you're, uh, uh, you're glowing white, but on the inside, you're a tomb, you're full of death. I mean, this is the lesson about the human heart that we see embodied in the prophetic calling of Moses. One of the signs is that Moses will overcome the serpent. Moses grabs the serpent, turns it into a staff. The serpent attacks Moses, but Moses turns it into an instrument of his own dominion. There's a lesson here, both typologically about Christ and spiritually about utilizing our own weaknesses and channeling the Holy Spirit through them. Maybe we talk about that another time, but... Um, uh, and then the other sign is Moses puts his hand in his cloak and it turns into a leprous hand representing death. He puts it right over his heart, it turns into death, but he puts it in again and it is cleansed. That anticipates the circumcision of the heart, the filling of the heart with life, the overcoming of death, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. As Jesus says, it is not what you take into you that makes you impure, it is what proceeds from your heart that makes you impure. Out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speaks, and by your words you are justified, by your words you are condemned. Well, Genesis is a kind of microcosm in a literary form of the whole history of salvation. We begin the way that, of course, the whole Bible begins, because Genesis is the beginning of the Bible, the creation of the world, primeval history, so on and so forth. Then you have the calling of Abraham, and it all leads down to the end of the book where Joseph represents the Messiah. Joseph's dream, the way that he's described in the dream, is associated with the prophecy of the Messiah in Genesis 49, 8 to 12. That's what we know. It says, your uh, mother's sons will bow down to you. So Joseph is explicitly identified as a type of the Messiah. So Luke's gospel, is this not the son of Joseph? Double meaning. Um, and uh, Joseph is ruling over Egypt, which is described as like the garden of the Lord in Genesis 13, verse 10. Uh, and Joseph says concerning his brothers, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Earlier, Pharaoh says, is this not a man who is wise and discerning, has the spirit of the holy God in him? In other words, Joseph, through suffering, is legitimately acquired of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is that fruit which gives man the capacity to reign and rule over the world by giving him wisdom to see what is good for a particular intention you want to make something you have an intention a purpose you want to fulfill in the world well you have to know what will be useful in realizing that intention and what will be not useful in other words what's good for this purpose and what's bad for this purpose this analogical use of the language good and bad is what explains what's going on here Good and evil is also what they call a merism, meaning by uh, using two words which capture two ends of, of a spectrum, you sum up the entirety of everything in between. So when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what you're doing is you're consuming the intuitive knowledge of all creation. Because the only way that you're going to be able to rule over creation with real wisdom is by apprehending its inner structure, its grammar, its wiring. And so when Solomon becomes wise, what does he study? Well, he studies everything. He has birds and beasts brought to him. He learns lessons from everything. He engages in political debates. The Queen of Sheba comes and seeks uh, to put difficult questions to him, questions of political wisdom. How do nations relate to each other in these morally ambiguous situations? Because the essence of wisdom is navigating successfully moral ambiguity. 
Joseph has become wise. He's legitimately, through suffering, eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He has been persecuted by his own flesh and blood. He has been thrown in a tomb, yet he has come out. He was brought to the nations in an incense caravan. And unlike his older brothers, who became a stench in the noses of the Canaanites, Joseph becomes a sweet savor to the nations. He is elevated to rule over the nations. He is made their king. He feeds them with the bread of life, saving them from the barrenness of famine. That has been a major theme throughout Genesis. Barrenness signifies the curse which was placed on the world through man on account of the fall. Joseph saves the world from that barrenness. And then, and only then, do his own brothers come to buy bread from him. And they recognize him and weep on his shoulder. And they are reconciled to him. And then Joseph reigns for many years. This is the story of the Messiah. And it is notable that Joseph says concerning God's intention in relation to the evil intentions of his brother, essentially what Peter says about the evil intentions of Israel in the flesh with respect to the crucifixion of Jesus. That is because the family dysfunction which accumulates throughout the history of Israel to build towards this catastrophic sin in the crucifixion of Jesus is typologically represented in the very same cumulative dysfunction in the life of the patriarchs. And because we are given a window into very specific family lines, we are able in certain ways to apply it in a more direct way to particular situations which we are dealing with in our own lives or in the lives of those whom God gives us to counsel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, these all have very concrete and specific problems in their families. I think it's one of the most bad mistakes to look at the Bible and think that these were people fundamentally different than we are. This is the basic thesis of the so-called context group, which insists, contrary to all literary evidence, that uh, ancient people did not feel any such thing as guilt. I mean, I consider it to be, uh, to put it kindly, hooey, but because we read about guilt, but this is alleged to not be talking about it because ancient people didn't feel guilt and the reason we know that is because they didn't talk about guilt so when they talked about guilt they were talking about something else and we know that because they didn't feel guilt and so on and so forth so what were the particular aspects of the family dysfunction what does a concrete reading of genesis's family history actually look like well, let's take a look. And this actually is one of the most um, compelling aspects of the Genesis story to me in terms of reading it as a history of real people, that it actually plays out like a real family history would play out. If you understand the actual goings on of the text, you recognize that it is the characters here are actually behaving like real historical people would behave in very concrete and real situations. These do not seem to be literary inventions of whomever the author or authors was supposed to, were supposed to be. That's just a side point, uh, but let's take a closer look at the particular nature of the dysfunction, and we of course will go on a number of uh, interesting or not so interesting, depending on your taste, tangents. So let's look at the particulars of this family history that we see in the book of Genesis. We begin in Genesis chapter 11, we have the genealogy of Shem leading down to Abraham at that point called Abram. Uh, Abram begins uh, with his father in Mesopotamia. Uh, this family uh, goes to uh, Haran and the older generation dies in Haran, and then Abram comes in to the land of Canaan. Now this should remind you of the story of the Exodus, because in the story of the Exodus, people come out of Egypt, the older generation dies in the wilderness, and then the next generation comes into the land and receives that which was promised. Now I want you to pay attention to the language that is used to make the Abrahamic promise. I will make of you a great nation, I will bless you, make your name great, that you will be a blessing. So God will make Abram's name great. He will give Abram by grace 
what the builders of the Tower of Babel or Babylon sought unsuccessfully according to the flesh. Make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, this language of blessing, of course, goes back to the creation week where God blesses these living things which he has created. He blesses the human family. More recently, it goes back to the disembarking from the ark after the flood. And it is this text which I think Genesis 12 is calling our attention to. Genesis 8.19 tells us every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. So we have everything that moves on the earth going out by families from the ark. Same words. Genesis 12 says, in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Those who curse you will curse. God uses the same language here in Genesis 8. I will never again curse the ground on account of man or in some renderings i will no further curse the ground on account of man and then in genesis 9 through the uh, uh, noahic ascension offering we are told that god blessed noah and his son said to them be fruitful multiply fill the earth notice this is the very same sort of thing which is being discussed in genesis chapter 12 abram abram is being promised a great family and he is being promised that through him shall all the families of the earth be blessed just as again and again in genesis 6 to 9 we are told that noah is blessed but also all of those who are with him are blessed and so this is the original divinely inspired basis for the typology of the church being the ark. The ark is a temple of God. It is built out of sanctified wood. It is built as a three-story miniature representation of the universe that ascends to the top of the holy mountain and rests thereupon. Likewise, the church is the true and real ark because it is in the church that the whole creation is gathered in not just a remnant of the creation but the whole creation is unified within its boundaries it is sanctified by the holy spirit it is made symbolically entirely of the olive wood which makes up the center of israel's liturgical system where god himself is enthroned and it is in the church that all the families of the nations are in gather all the families of the nations are blessed now in genesis 6 to 9 noah is commanded to gather representative portions of every sort of seed and bring it into the ark but this is just portions of every seed the ark is nothing but a remnant it is a representative sampling of everything in the antediluvian world and the vast majority of the world is destroyed this is the baptism of the world by water genesis ends with a baptism by fire namely a baptism by heat it is a famine which is described as going all across the face of the earth a phrase that calls our attention back to the waters which were all across the face of the earth in genesis chapter 7 and 8 but whereas Noah gathered simply representative seeds of all plant life into the ark, Joseph actually harvests a abundant harvest representing the actual redemption of the nations collectively. For it is not a remnant of the nations which come to Joseph to receive the bread of life, spiritually speaking. It is the nations themselves. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, bends his knee, professes that the Spirit of God dwells within Joseph, acknowledges the wisdom which he teaches, and he facilitates the teaching of this wisdom to all the nations. We see that the priesthood of Egypt is purified and dedicated to the God of heaven. We know this because Joseph marries a priestly family. 
and there is a special portion of the land which is dedicated to the priesthood of Egypt. We should always remember that paganism is not the primary historical or religious reality, including for the Gentiles. The principal religious system, which we should take as normal in the real sense of that word for the nations of the world, was the religious system that was governed by the Noachic Covenant. And that is why we see all across the world uh, abundant evidence of the worship of the one God of heaven. And that is what he's called the God of heaven. Gentiles call him the God of heaven in the scriptures. And so anthropologists today talk about this as the so-called sky God phenomenon. You have Shang-Ti, the emperor of heaven in China. You've got the heart of heaven in Mesoamerica. One really could go on um, ad, ad nauseum. There is uh, an incredible amount of evidence for this. It, it's rather ridiculous to hear speculations about the so-called origins of monotheism in the reign of Akhenaten when the evidence is open and shut that monotheism uh, long preceded Akhenaten and the evidence is very much in favor of monotheism that is that there is a ontologically distinct supreme god who created the world and stands in a relation of absolute sovereignty to it the evidence is very strong this is the primeval form of human worship. So the question is really one of faith. Are the patriarchs going to trust God to give them life on God's own terms? And will they trust that this is for their ultimate good? The enemy sought to trick the earliest humans into believing that God was hoarding life for himself. This is why Abraham's test is going to be his consecration of his seed on the holy mountain to God. It is called an ascension offering, just as Noah offers all creation as an ascension offering. It is on Moriah, that is the mountain where Solomon later builds the temple of the Lord. And the seed is the representative of life itself. So the idea of resurrection is couched again and again in rebirth from the earth. Death is signified throughout Genesis in these barren lands because the earth, Adama, is feminine. And so when the earth is fruitful, it is a fruitful bride, which is giving forth a harvest to God as bridegroom. So the patriarch's wives, in being barren, correspond to the famines which the patriarchs have to endure throughout the text. This is not yet the land flowing with milk and honey, as you can tell. Genesis 12, Genesis 20, climaxing at the end of the book of Genesis, where the famine not only strikes Canaan, but uh, prevails across the face of the whole earth. But what we see is how God repurposes death itself and turns it into an instrument for life, redemption, and resurrection. And we see how he does this not only for the patriarchs, miraculously bringing children for their wives, but also for the Gentiles. Genesis chapter 20, Abimelech, his, uh, uh, his household are given families from God after they do God's will and Abraham makes intercession. So blessing falls both on Abraham's family and on the families of the nations. And yet, Abram jumps the gun. There is a covenant fall renewal pattern that runs throughout the scriptures, and one of the early instances of it is in Genesis 15. Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham. Abraham offers the five animals, which become the five central animals of Israel's sacrificial system. He divides them in two. He goes into a deep sleep, just as Adam went into a deep sleep in Genesis 2. The Holy Spirit passes between the two parts of the divided animals, thereby stitching them back together, just as God stitched Adam and Eve together into a new and glorious form of humanity. And just as Eve, or Isha, uh, provides the opportunity for Adam to be called Ish, which is a play on the word esh for fire. So also it is the fire of the Holy Spirit which reunites the two halves of these animals. And nevertheless, in the next chapter, we are told that Abram listened to the voice of his wife. 
Now in Genesis 3, Eve is deceived because she had not yet been created when Adam was given the commandment to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She had learned it from Adam. And we are also told in verse 6 of Genesis 3 that Adam was with her as the serpent was speaking to her. So she presumably would have expected him to speak up, but Adam seemed to be more interested in whether God was lying or not. He was interested to see whether Eve would drop dead. As James Jordan memorably puts it, he had only known her for a few hours. I mean, that's important to the story. It's not, you know, just a funny little detail. It's, it helps to explain why he behaved in this way. He was interested in seeing whether she would drop dead. And when she didn't, he decided God was a liar and he was going to take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And by the same token here in Genesis 16, Sarai is in the wrong, but this is not a sin committed with a high hand. Uh, this is not a sin which is committed in flagrant rebellion against God. It is a sin that is committed out of frustration. Presumably, Abram himself had been expressing frustration. It presumably caused strain in their marital relationship. And they had come out of an idolatrous background where certainly worse things than this had been done. And Sarai thinks, okay, this is going to bring relative peace compared to what we've had to deal with. This is just how things are going to work. But naturally, after Hagar is given to Abram and Abram has Ishmael through Hagar, he realizes he has screwed up because Sarai naturally becomes jealous and Sarai, despite um, giving Hagar to Abram as a concubine, uh, is the mistress of the house. And the way that she is described in relation to Hagar, Sarai isn't a villain, this is hardly not understandable, but uh, in relation to Hagar, she is described in the language that Pharaoh will be described later in the biblical text. Uh, Hagar, when she has to flee from Sarai, she finds water in the wilderness, just as Israel will find water in the wilderness. And when Isaac is later born, Genesis 17 is the covenant renewal part of the pattern where Abram's flesh is cut off. Isaac is born and Isaac and Ishmael, they know each other for the earlier part of their lives. Uh, but uh, Sarai is furious at Ishmael and sees him as a potential competitor. So she drives Hagar out of the household and Abram basically does nothing to defend his son. Now, he shouldn't have done what he did, but he should not have punished his son simply to appease his wife. As you can see here, what we're dealing with is a bunch of characters who are remarkably morally complex for all of the assessments of the Hebrew Bible and ancient narrative that they don't deal in categories like this. These are moral gray areas leading some people to insist that there are in fact no moral categories in Genesis because apparently they cannot imagine the biblical author actually having a complicated view of life and then because they can't imagine it they say the scriptures are uh, unrealistically simple so obviously um, I'm relatively impatient with it but nobody here is an outright villain Everybody's sins here are, uh, by the, some of the standards that we see later in Scripture, relatively minor, but they coalesce to form this catastrophically dysfunctional family. Abram doesn't really, Abraham doesn't really know what to do, so he decides, well, the easiest thing to do is just to kick uh, Hagar and uh, Ishmael out. I'll give them some bread, some water, and they can go fend for themselves. And Hagar and Ishmael almost die. Basically condemns his son to potentially die in the desert and, you know, just get out of here, come what, come what may. Well, God, of course, intervenes. He prevents that from happening. Ishmael is blessed he becomes the father of 12 princes anticipating of course Jacob becoming the father of 12 uh, uh, tribal lords and Ishmael is, is never described as a wicked man uh, he's described as a man with whom uh, God is present uh, he is present at Abraham's funeral uh, so it's just a mistake to take him as a, as a wicked man 
But for our purposes, the most relevant thing here is that Isaac is watching all of these years. Isaac is the favorite. He is the son of the wife, not the concubine. His brother was kicked out of the house for something which was not his own fault. He was essentially left to fend for himself with his mother, who was a slave of the household. Had no independent means besides what Abraham gave her. Abraham was basically a coward. And what does Isaac pick up from this? That this is basically how things work. So when Isaac has children, he replicates the sins of the father. He has a favorite too. Esau is the obvious favorite, despite the covenant being divinely promised to Jacob. Whether you take that as a prophecy or a promise, I take it as a promise, but the story as a whole shows that Esau despised the covenant, at least until he weeps on his brother's shoulder in reconciliation. Uh, but Isaac has a favorite too, and Esau is quite violent. When uh, when Jacob receives the blessing, uh, Esau wants to kill him. And what does Isaac do to defend Jacob, who is in the right here? Basically nothing. He sends him away to uh, uh, their weird uncle, who lives uh, uh, quite a ways away, and doesn't hear from him. Uh, Jacob is mistreated by Uncle Laban. He's treated basically as a slave. He's paid irregularly, if at all. He is deceived unjustly. I don't want to get into the whole deception theme here. It's quite complicated how this functions in the Jacob story, but I just want to focus on the family history dimension of this. Uh, but the sins of Abraham have intensified so that we're not just dealing with drama among the adults which affects the children in a, uh, a way which is not their fault. We've actually gotten to a point where the favoritism is so obvious that Esau grows up to be a degenerate who marries two Canaanite women who wants to murder his own brother and while Isaac replicates the sins of his father he does not compensate for the intensification of that sin in his son Esau. So he, like Abraham, essentially sends Jacob away. He has to run for his life now and see what happens. Well, Jacob will suffer his way unto glorification, and Esau weeps twice in this story. The first time he weeps is uh, when he does not receive any blessing from his father. He says, is there no blessing left for me? And the next time he weeps is when Jacob is coming back into the land and he hears that Esau is coming with uh, what sounds like an army of hundreds of men and he prays and he's wrestled by God and Jacob's prevailing in that wrestling signifies that God has, as a father, been wrestling him his whole life to make him strong, to grow him up, and to bring him into glory. We've discussed this in earlier videos on the theology of Genesis. Uh, but the next time Esau weeps is on Jacob's shoulder, because through Jacob's prayer, intercession, and by Jacob's participation in all of the things which Esau justly suffered, he anticipates Christ in this way, Christ suffers the suffering that we have justly but he redeems us and gives us something which is not less than justice but which is more than justice and so Esau weeps on his brother's shoulder but as regards the family history dimension what happens next Jacob is the younger brother and he has a number of sons and who's the young son now well it's Joseph and just as Jacob empathizes and identifies with the young sons, he flips his father's favoritism and shows Joseph obvious favoritism. Now, Joseph is 17 years old. He is uh, a teenager in my, I mean, I, I to be honest, I, I 
the coming of age theme in the Hebrew Bible was quite a significant theme. There's clearly a distinction between adolescence and a full adulthood in the scripture. I think the idea that adolescence is purely a modern invention is uh, overstated to say the very least, just in case anybody mentions that. But Joseph presumably behaved like a teenager. His father shows him obvious favoritism. He gives him a very expensive uh, coat. Uh, Joseph essentially flaunts that. He decides to tell everyone that he had a dream where his brothers were all bowing down to him. Now, we know that this dream is part of the Bible, and we know that it is from God. But if you are there, it's going to look a lot more complicated. People have dreams all the time. We don't know at this point that Joseph has a gift for dreams from God and for interpreting them in accordance with wisdom. All we know is that this arrogant little bastard, whose daddy's favorite, his obvious favorite, has just decided to pour salt on the wounds by announcing that his brothers are going to have to apologize and bow down before him and oh by the way that's God speaking so it's hardly surprising that it ends up where it does and so we have undertaken a journey here from Abram and Sarai's uh, back and forth awkwardness dysfunction and it's multiplied into the dysfunction of Isaac and his children and it's multiplied into the dysfunction of Jacob and his children until we get murder or what looks like murder typologically anticipating the true murder of Jesus Christ who is the son of Joseph but at the climax of this supremely dysfunctional family, at the moment where it has finally reached the fullness of iniquity, and the innocent boy is murdered, thrown into the pit of shale, sold into slavery by his own brothers, this is the moment at which God is most active. So just as we talked earlier about how God has repurposed famines in order to produce a great harvest of life for all nations this is the moment at which he does this repurposing because when joseph is lowered down into the pit of death what ends up happening is not that joseph is lowered down to the pit of death but that joseph is drawn up as the spring of the water of life from a well which is going to give life to all nations now, Jacob's older sons have already displayed acts of violence in the order of the Genesis story. Some have argued it's dischronologized, but as far as the order of the Genesis story, we already know that uh, Simeon and Levi are violent. They have murdered all of the Shechemites while they were recovering from their circumcision. In other words, Jacob was bringing them under the covenant, bringing them into the family. And so this was kin slaying in addition to just straight up murder. And Jacob says, you have made me a stench in the nose of the people all around. We may have already talked about this either in today's or yesterday's video. Um, but Joseph descends into Egypt in an incense caravan and becomes a sweet savor in the noses of the Gentiles. And we see that his brothers, who brought shame on the divine name by their violence, become the very unwitting instruments in that same violent behavior through which the shame is undone and repaired because it's that violence by which Joseph is sent into Egypt and sweetens the name of God to all the nations. And the barrenness that falls upon the land together with the immense guilt that has been growing and maturing for years upon years in the minds of these brothers who've been keeping the secret from their father. I mean, you imagine what it would be like to keep the secret. Father would probably reminisce and, and mourn regularly, and they would all know and have to keep it from him that they had no idea where Joseph really was, that he could still be alive down there. They presumed he was probably being mistreated and beaten as a slave, whereas he was really 
being exalted. But all of these circumstances are being threaded together at once by God's nimble fingers, quick as wind. And he takes all of these broken threads and he stitches them back together in the very motions by which they are torn. Every tear which we attempt to put into the fabric ends up rippling outwards to stitch back together five other wounds at the same time. And all of this leads to famine coming on the world, which actually becomes life for the world. Joseph gives life to the nations. Joseph's brothers come. They weep on his shoulder, just as Esau and Jacob wept on each other's shoulders. And thus, the world is redeemed. This is the end of the story as far as Genesis is concerned. It both forms the prelude to the major story of the Old Covenant with the book of Exodus, but it also forms an image of the whole story of the human family with Jesus Christ who forms the uh, climactic uh, moment of human history, uh, who is murdered by his own brothers who is murdered in the worst crime ever to be committed in human history and yet is the one through whom the greatest act of divine grace to ever be accomplished is accomplished and all of this happens in the same moment and Jesus is hailed as king by the nations of the world the Roman Emperor bends his knee and professes the God of Abraham as his God and ultimately when that redemption is soaked through all the nations, we are told in the New Testament that it will provoke Israel according to the flesh to jealousy, so that he who was the first shall also be last. Uh, Israel according to the flesh forms the seed for the church. They are the remnant according to the election of grace through which life sprouts forth and then that life works its way through the nations, provokes the remaining portion of Israel according to the flesh of jealousy, and they cap the progress of the gospel just as they founded it. So uh, that's what we have for today. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, what I wanted to really kind of drive home was the concreteness of the biblical story. Um, and I think the, the practical takeaway is that this is not just something which happens in the Bible. The particularity of this biblical story gives us a window into how God is always working at every time because there is no generic humanity. There is no human beings in general. There are a vast number of specific human stories of family histories which the father is writing at this very moment and in your family there are generational scars as well as generational blessings and promises and all of these stories are being written at once and in relation to each other and all of them are part of this great story of the children of Adam who are redeemed in the son of Adam who is also the son of God and in addition to being part of that story they also contribute to its fulfillment because the one who is healed becomes a healer so uh, we'll have more to say in the future on the theology of family and scripture um, but with that said I will see you soon <laughs>